Holy Gospel according to Matthew, the fifth chapter. Glory, Glory to you, O Lord. Lord. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up the mountain, and after he sat down, his disciples came to him. Then he began to speak, and he taught them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they will receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they will see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they will be called children of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. And blessed are you when people revile you and persecute you and utter all kinds of evil against you falsely on my account. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward is great in heaven, for in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. The Gospel of the Lord. Praise to you, O Christ. I invite you to be seated. So Jesus climbs up a mountain to teach. And uh, I think whenever I was growing up, I would always imagine that he'd be on this mountain. He's screaming down, blessed are the peacemakers. But it's probably more a Palestinian hillside that he's sitting on. But that imagery wouldn't have been lost on people that were listening to this text. That's the place you go up to be close to God. But the thing is, Jesus uses a very special word in all of these things. And that word is blessed. Now, in other translations, they translate it as happy. And these are great words. We use them all the time in today's language. They mean more like feelings. Like, how you doing? Oh, I'm too blessed to be stressed, right? Uh, I'm, I'm blessed. How are you? Oh, I'm happy, yeah. Or we say things like, I just want my kids to be happy. I hope you have a happy marriage. You know, happy Thanksgiving, whatever. There's all kinds of ways that we use these words that are much more about our feelings. When Jesus is saying the word blessed... He's using the Greek word, now I've got to get it right, I'm going to say it wrong, makarios, or makarios. You can look it up and tell me what's the right way of saying it later. Don't do it during the sermon. But makarios, and this word is not only used in our Greek text of the New Testament, it was used in the Old Testament, and it was also used in secular writings around the time that, it, that this was written. And makarios means... Close proximity to the divine. Isn't that cool? Blessed. Makarios. Close proximity to the divine. And whenever you read it that way, all of a sudden you start thinking about blessed are the more, those who mourn. Those that are with others that are mourning and you're feeling their pain and you're recognizing the anguish that they're going through. That's the close proximity to God. For those that are sharing peace, not wanting anything from the other person, but just to freely love them for who they are, that's the close proximity to God. What a cool statement that Jesus is saying to the people. And it's also really beautiful that this is also the same Sunday that we hear Micah from the prophet Micah. And there's not a mistake that these two are tied together. We all know Micah 6, 8. It's a very familiar uh, a part of scripture. Do justice, love kindness, and walk humbly with your God. How many of y'all have ever heard that before somewhere? Right? You ever seen it on a billboard? Somebody maybe has it on their t-shirt or something. It's a beautiful statement. It makes me feel kind of good, you know. That was until I read it this summer. And I want to tell you about an experience that I had with this very statement this past summer. So I was on sabbatical, and Becca and I were coming back from our Appalachian trip, and we stopped in Alabama. And uh, there's this place that we've been wanting to see called the National Museum of Peace and Justice. The National Museum of Peace and Justice. And I didn't really know what to expect. We tried to take our kids to it one time, and uh, it was closed, and we kind of walked all around it on the outside. You couldn't really see in. But this time, we made sure we could get in, and, and we went, and we stopped, and uh, we bought our tickets, and we go inside. And it's about a city block. This, this whole museum is about a city block, and it's an outdoor museum. And you go in, and there's these beautiful manicured lawns, and there's these walls with all these beautiful sayings on it. And you start walking around, and then you get to the first major display, and you come face to face with a pillar that's about six feet tall. It's rectangular. It's steel. And there's about 800 of these, more than 800 of these pillars all throughout this middle part. And as you're looking at this pillar, you read a county 
in America. Over 800 counties now are listed on these pillars. And underneath that county are names and dates of people that were lynched. And you're standing there looking at this massive amount of pillars. And you start walking through them. And you're kind of walking around them. And there's people all around you walking around them. And then all of a sudden you realize that the floor is declining. But the pillars are staying the same height. And so you keep walking through them, seeing different counties, trying to find your county from your birth, the county that you live in right now. I found Bear County, names listed. I found Brazoria County, which is my hometown. I saw names listed. And as I kept walking through, they kept getting higher and higher and higher until all of a sudden we're underneath them. And you're looking up at these pillars hanging above you with names of people that were lynched. It was absolutely moving and a very emotional thing. You keep walking around this lawn and there are statues and there are artwork pieces depicting slavery, racial tension, freedom. And then you go to this one part where each county in America is offered an opportunity to acknowledge, to pay reparations, to just know that they were a part of this part of their history and claim it in their own documents and they can erect their own statue their own um, uh, pillar right there there's about 30 of those so beck and i are walking around this whole thing just moved quiet nobody's talking we're just absolutely moved by this experience we go into the visitor center walk around there and you can go and watch a movie you can um, uh, buy books and, and, and see other, other things and, 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 and listen to history and people are talking about it. We go into the gift shop and I see this t-shirt. Do justice, love kindness, walk humbly. And I realized who I am in that moment. My own history. And I'm probably related to people that participated in this. My place of privilege and power. And it took on a new meaning for me in that moment. And then I come to scripture today as I'm studying it. And I realize that's what Mike is trying to tell the people to begin with. See, the people that he's talking to, this is right before the Assyrians are going to come and wipe them out. And he's looking at them and he's saying, I can see them out the window. They're on our front lawn. The Assyrians are coming and they're going to take us all over. We've got to change what we're doing. Because the people in Micah's time were... Uh, treating people with injustice. They weren't adhering to the laws of the Torah, the oral written laws, the, the, the oral laws of the written laws. They were doing whatever they wanted. They were turning from God. They were turning toward the self and only seeking out their own ambitions. And Mike is looking at them going, do you not know what kind of people we are? Do you not know where we have been? Have you not seen what we have done in the past? What we have been through. And he describes throughout the entire book of, of Micah, which is really more poems. It's an easy read. You should check it out. The, uh, 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 he talks about their history, their shared history. How for generations, people have turned away from God to turn towards self. To only find themselves in problems. They've been enslaved. They've been captured. They've been exiled. They're in exodus. To only turn back toward God because some prophet or king or judge or word comes to them and they recognize their brokenness and they turn back to God and they come back into that right relationship with God and God who is just and merciful always forgives, always accepts, always pardons, remembers the covenant, remembers all the promises and God restores and they keep going for a while and then they turn away from God and the cycle begins again. This happens over and over and over and over again throughout Scripture. You can read Judges. You can read the Kings. You can read David. Yeah, all of it. All of it has these same cycles over and over and over again. So Micah is explaining to them just the Exodus. Just this one big story that they should all know. Don't they remember that they were slaves in Egypt? And how God freed them and delivered them to the promised land? And even while they were in the middle of it all. God forgave them. God provided for them. God did not relent. God remembered. God honored the promises, honored the covenant, and saw them into the promised land. So Micah looks at these people and says, what is God requiring of you? What does God ask? It's not, not even to be faithful. Do justice. Love. Kindness. 
and walk humbly with God. Because God is not in that temple. God is not on that mountaintop. God is right here calling us to do justice and love kindness. And when we are, we are walking humbly with God. When Jesus is on that mountain, I always thought that he was the one closest to God like Moses. You know, when you read about Moses going up on the mountain, he's the one that sees God. He's the one that talks to God. He comes down, he covers with the veil, and he gives God to the people. That's what I kind of thought Jesus was doing. Like, he's getting the word. He's the closest. He gets the lion's share of, of God. And then it goes down to the disciples who get a little bit more. And then it trickles down the mountain to the people on the lawn. They get a little bit more. And then it comes through the pages of scripture through generations through generations through generations all the way to us in 2023. And we're holding on to like a little thread. And we get just a little bit of being close to God. That's what I used to think this was. But Jesus is looking at us and saying, you are right now in the divine presence. You are in close proximity to the divine right now. Not on some mountain. Right now. Right here. You are blessed. What do we do with that? Well, if you're blessed, you're going to comfort those that are mourning. And you're going to experience the divine present. You're going to speak out for those that are oppressed. You're going to work for justice, which, by the way, is freeing the person that is oppressed and trying to free the oppressor at the same time. And folks, that is not easy. Jesus is saying, you are blessed. Don't look up to the mountain to find God. God is right here. You are close to the divine presence right now. The closest proximity you could ever be. You are blessed. What are we going to do with this? Amen.